So, you know, we're going to be examining the evidence. Um, so why are meat and milk viewed as essential for people? What are the key nutrients in these foods? And can we get enough of these key nutrients from plant foods? Uh, how much do we need? Uh, what are the actual intakes in plant-based diets? What are the richest plant sources? And are there benefits to getting these nutrients from plants instead of from animal sources? So let's start out, why are meat and milk viewed as essential for people? Well, we need to look at public health history. For many years, hunger and malnutrition were the number one public health nutrition concerns. Government policies were directed towards the elimination of hunger and deficiency diseases. Nutrition education campaigns were really dominated by eat more messages so that we could wipe out these deficiency diseases. And economic policies actually sought to maximize meat and milk production to reduce malnutrition because they were, these were concentrated sources of you know, calcium in, in milk and protein in meat and farmer subsidies, marketing, marketing support, price controls, all of these things were set into place. And they figured it was a job pretty well done. Diseases of nutritional deficiencies diminished, and the interests of animal agriculture became very deeply entrenched in the economy. It appeared as though the job of improving the health through nutrition had been very effectively accomplished. Meat and milk acquired health halos. Meat is now associated with protein, muscles, and masculinity. Milk is associated with calcium and strong bones and teeth. Everybody learns this in grade school. Everybody knows it. But the eat more messages have backfired. While nutritional deficiency diseases plummeted, the eat more message gave rise to another malnutrition menace called overconsumption. And you know, when we think about malnutrition, what comes to mind? It's usually when you hear the word malnutrition, you think of children in Africa who are starving, right? In, during the Ethiopian famine and the children with the large bellies, but they're so, so skinny. And that's what most people think of. But really, there are three types of malnutrition. One is undernutrition or hunger. The second is micronutrient deficiencies, like a vitamin A deficiency, which causes blindness and is the lead cause of on the planet. Number three is overconsumption. And overconsumption is now a bigger threat, malnutrition-wise, than is hunger or malnutrition. It actually exceeded, the numbers have exceeded the numbers who are dying of starvation. And it's become the new norm. Overconsumption now exceeds, as I mentioned, undernutrition as the number one form of malnutrition globally. And as a result, these diseases kill about 70% of the global population. So this is what we learned. What we learned is it was not lack of meat or cow's milk that was responsible for malnutrition. It was a lack of a variety of nutritious foods. Now we know that, and we have an abundance of research studies that show us that plant-based diets are more healthy term for preventing uh, disease. And national and international diet guidelines are now reflecting this knowledge. And I showed this yesterday, but I want to show it again today. The World Health Organization's 12 Steps to Healthy Eating, the first step is eat a nutritious diet based on a variety of foods originating mainly from plants rather than from animals. Cancer organizations, you know, this is American Cancer Society, eat a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant foods. World Cancer Research Fund, eat mostly foods of plant origin. The American Institute of Cancer Research, 
Choose mostly plant foods like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and cut out sugary drinks. If we look even at the dietary guidelines for, uh, for American Scientific Advisory Committee, they said a dietary pattern that is higher in plant-based foods, such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and lower in animal-based foods, is more health-promoting and is associated with less environmental impact than is the current US diet. And this is Canada's food guide. And I think um, this is the culmination of a lot of, of information over many years. But what we have done in Canada is we actually um, stopped the influence of industry on national nutrition recommendations. So we normally, nutrition recommendations are very much very much influenced by industry. And our government said, they're, you know, that's, that's not going to happen this time. Our nutrition guidelines are, are going to be based on science, not on selling products. And yeah, I mean, just wonderful news. So you can see when you look at the guide, something is missing. I mean, a quarter of the plate used to be dairy products. Well, they're not there, except for in the corner where you've got the protein-rich foods. It's included as one of the options. Half the plate's fruit and vegetables, a quarter of the plate is whole grains, and the other quarter is protein-rich foods of, you know, you've got tofu there, you've got beans there, you've got nuts and seeds there, and you've got some of the animal products as well. But a huge, huge stride in the right direction.